Good evening. Welcome to 1999, the year in review. We begin our look back to the last six months of 1999 right after this, so please stay tuned. It's a land with over 10,000 miles of coastline, thousands of inlets, coves, guts, and bays, a land that lives by the sea. No wonder our dogs have webbed feet. Imagine that. We begin our look back to 1999 with a story from one of our July news broadcasts. There seems to be quite a bit of increased activity at the fish plant. A Thursday this week, we visited the fish plant to see how the work was proceeding. We spoke with Mr. Clayton Ingram, who gave us an update on activity at the plant. Mr. Ingram informed us that work was proceeding as scheduled and that the deadline for the completion of the work was August the 1st. To date, there are 22 workers from Virgil, four workers from Daly Brothers, and two contract workers are at the plant. So far, they have installed new units for refrigeration. They have done much of the needed carpentry work, some electrical work, and completed the installation at the water lines. They have also done quite a bit of painting and lots of general cleanup work. Left to be done is some carpentry and electrical work, plus more general cleanup. Although processing is not yet started at our plant, the work is a positive sign of things to come in the future. In August, the RCMP had an accident while traveling on an assistance call. On Thursday, July 29th, the RCMP boat ran into Boar Island. We contacted the RCMP to find out what happened. At approximately 11 p.m. on Thursday, July the 29th, the RCMP left Bergia to answer an assistant call from the Buren RCMP. The fog was very thick and visibility was zero. The crew were relying on their instruments to guide them. At approximately 11.15 p.m., the boat veered off course, and before the crew realized what was happening, they crashed into Boar Island. There were five people on board, three RCMP officers, RCMP auxiliary officer, and the fisheries officer. The Coast Guard was called for assistance, but the RCMP boat made it back under their own power. There were miners there was minor damage done to the boat. One RCMP officer suffered a broken leg and the rest had minor cuts and bruises. Bail bowls was the topic of our next news story, or maybe we should say his catch was. On Monday of this week, Mr. Bail Bowles got quite a surprise when he all his nets. Mr. Bowles and his crew were surprised to find a swordfish in their net on Monday. This has been the first swordfish caught in this area in recent memory. The fish weighed in at 201 pounds. Some of swordfish can weigh as much as 1,200 pounds. It seems that these fish only come around when the water temperatures are quite warm. Most of the people on the wharf on Monday agreed that swordfish was good to eat and in some places was in more in demand than shark. We checked some facts on the computer and found out that indeed swordfish is quite good. The most popular recipe was swordfish steak. We spoke briefly to Mr. Bowles. So where'd, you, where'd you get until? Which one on? on? So that's an unusual catch, obviously, eh? For sure, yeah. It was the first one ever I seen. Yeah. And you've been fishing now long? Oh, ten years or more. How many? Ten years or more. Okay, yeah. He intends to keep the sword from the fish for a souvenir. So did Leonard say if there was a market for that? Oh yes, yeah, there's a market for them, yeah. yeah. Timber brought great news for the fish plant. This week has been like an emotional roller coaster for our town, starting with Sunday, September 19, when a public meeting was called concerning our plant and its future. Most of the 250 people that attended last Sunday's meeting didn't know what to expect. Some suspected that the news was good because Mr. Bellberry was in town. Others were prepared for the worst. It wasn't long before we knew that the news wasn't good. Mayor Ann called the meeting to rally the people of Virgil to go to St. John's for a demonstration to make sure that the crab from the Tis fishery was brought to Virgil, Ramia, and Galtos. Gentlemen. Glad so many of you have turned out this evening. I'll introduce the people here on the 
stage this evening is, of course, Bill Wojano, George Reed, the very MHA, Kelvin Parsons, part of the consortium, Bill Berry, uh, Eileen from the Union, Edie from the Union, Arch from the Union, and uh, Gerald from the Union. Uh, so we're represented municipally by me, provincially by Calvin here. Our government, our owner is represented by Bill, and we've even got visitors here today from the province of Manitoba. So we do have a little federal involvement here, and I'm sure that Bill Matthews would be here. I spoke to him yesterday morning, didn't know anything about it, but I uh, haven't been able to track him down this afternoon. He's somewhere on his way to Stephenville. I do know that much, and I'm sure we'll hear from him later. But anyway, getting all these formalities one side, it's just about a year ago, or it is a year ago, that we, we stopped here in the same building, the same place, and tried to put together a strategy to get our fish plant open. Uh, a lot of people think that we've won the battle and that our fish plant will be open. In my opinion, we haven't got enough yet. There's not enough commitment. There's not enough signing on the dotted line to confirm it forever and a day for the town of Virgil. There's players out there that they might have good intentions. I'm not saying they don't. But I don't think that we can go forever and a day on a whim and a wish that the town of Port de Grave or communities in that area is going to say when Virgil is finished. I think we people here in Virgil have got to have a say in our own destination. What our future is. I don't think we can leave it up to someone else. I don't think I can leave it to Cal Parson. He could be elected in the next election. He might not. Can't leave it to Bill Barry. I can't trust him. I can't trust anybody. I can't even trust me. We got to have something tied down to this town. And that's the whole idea today. As I see it now, it's not good enough what have come down the tube. We didn't stay a full year, keep our mouth shut, to find out I, how, how many people are listening to Mr. Dalywall on, uh, on Friday. Did you hear what he said? We can't tell boats where the land. <laughs> and if he doesn't tell boats where the land, they're not going to land in Virgil. That you can be sure of. And we got to go there. And we've got to lobby a little bit harder. And we got to let someone know that the South Coast might be a thousand kilometers by land and only 300 miles by sea. But we're here and we're alive and they got a damn well look out to us. They took from us our ground fish. Whether they did it on purpose or not, there was mismanagement, but for some reason, the trawler that we saw for over 50 years walking down that reach is not going up and down there anymore. And it's time that they put it on the line. If they screwed up, if I go to prison for 20 years for a crime I didn't do, someone compensates me. And if they made a mistake, then they got to compensate the people who, who, who is the result of that mistake. And that's what we're here today for. And it's no good, I've got to ask this, I've took it as far as I can go. And I'm going into a meeting as far as I know on Tuesday or Wednesday. But outside that door when I go in, I want some of you people there supporting me. God, I'll tell you, when I walk in there, the decision is going to be made. They're only going to inform me what the decision is. They're not going to let me be part of that decision. But when they go in there on Tuesday, and you're outside, you're going to influence that bloody decision. So, having said that, and I never got a chance after a meeting this morning, I never got a chance last night to prepare and make the notes that I hope to make in this meeting today. But, I took it as far as I can go. And I need your help. Tomorrow, and during this week. And you must be committed to your town. This is not going to be a vacation. 
I can guarantee you that. You're not going to have a nice soft bid or anything like that. But we got to go in there because if we think for one minute, oh yes, I've got every belief that this fall these harvesters will go out there and prove to us that they can do what we said they can do. But when the quota is established in the year 2000, which I believe is for three years, is that right, Bill? Usually, usually it's a three-year management plan. Right. When they got it, they're no different than you and me. Whichever way they can make the most money, that's the way they're going to do it. And you ain't going to make the most money steaming through Virgil if you can drop it off somewhere else. It's just, it's just, it's just logistics. It's just mathematical that it's not coming here unless we go and try to make it come here. We've got me here. I still got one here, Captain, sitting right over there. Why did that man haven't got a boat, a 65 foot boat, and a crab license? I'll tell you why. He didn't need it. That man didn't need the damn thing. He was fishing ground fish, making a good living, and supplying the people in this town. That is the reason that these people down there got all the crab licenses, because we didn't need them in Virgil. But we've had taken from us what we had, and we want some of what they got. So, why do other people speak here today? And if this is, if you disagree with me, that's one thing I want to be make it perfectly clear. Please put your wish here today, what you, you want done or you don't want done. Because, you know, I, I can't carry on. I mean, if you think everything is fine, dandy, you want to go home this evening, lie down, forget it all, that's fine with me. But when you wake up next year, and you've got nothing, and your unemployment is run down, and all you've got is welfare, you're going to wish to hell that you got on board with us tomorrow. The town rallied to the mayor for support, and on Monday evening at 6 p.m., three buses filled with approximately 150 people from Burgio and Ramia made the long trip to St. John's. The business community made their presence known as well, with donations of pop, chips, donuts, and money.
approximately 2.30 p.m. on Tuesday, the news came over the radio that Burgio, Ramia, and Galtos had gotten what they came for. We took our cameras to the wharf on Wednesday when the buses arrived back in town. attended the public meeting held on Thursday for an update on the plant situation. Mayor Ann answered questions from the audience. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you all here this evening. It's good to see a turnout to what the results was. Uh, it's as good probably as it was uh, Sunday. But the reason I call this meeting the, this uh, evening is mainly that I know many of you must have a lot of questions on your mind to ask and to explain to you just exactly what what did uh, come about in uh, in St. John's. There hasn't been a chance to really explain it to anybody and even the people who were in St. John's you could only speak and get a few words out and then something else would happen and so on. There was never a get together. So uh, it was difficult to get out uh, just what did happen. And I, I, I guess to uh, really explain some of it, you've got to give a little history because I know you've heard this word exploratory fishery being tossed about and wondering what exploratory is and so on. But anyway, uh, the old thing is is that we've been trying to get crab outside of the 200 mile limit, or rather outside of 200 miles. And it's, uh, it's new areas which uh, haven't been fished uh, that much in the past. And uh, before scientists, well, give approval for more quotas and so on to take more crab out from there. They need to have evidence so that if they do something, they can at least say that they didn't do it by just uh, flipping a coin and that there was some scientific evidence went in there. Now there was an, uh, a, a, a test fishery out there last fall and, uh, and that resulted in, a, in an increase in quota uh, for the year 1999. Now, the increase uh, 
quota in 1999 was fished real fast in the spring, and uh, the results of that fishery was uh, really applied uh, as uh, as evidence or uh, or some uh, inf information towards what could be called another exploratory fishery. Uh, they're looking at increasing the quota outside 200 for the year 2000 but they wanted some more information. So therefore, the minister approved an exploratory fishery. That's a fishery which there is no, uh, no quota. They fish certain, certain spots, they have uh, trip limits, and uh, they fish it until such time as uh, they get enough information to say yes or no, there will be an increase in the year 2000. So anyway, the minister announced it, but he also announced that it had to be fished by the existing fleet. Now, as you know, uh, Falcon Seafood said uh, so many vessels geared up, which they had hoped to move into that fishery and to get into the exploratory and bring the fish into Virgil. Uh, this made quite a resistance from the uh, existing harvesters. And these harvesters are from the Labrador coast uh, it's, it's called 2J3K. They come down, uh, they'd like to get at it, but they're not allowed to fish it either. But there's another group of fishermen which is in 3LNO, it's the Porta Grave, uh, down around the real northeast coast. So these people, when they heard the companies was getting in, they stood up. And they said, no way, there's not going to be no new entrance in this fishery. Now, when they said this, of course that put us in a bit of a bit of a bind because if Falcon Seafoods couldn't go out and harvest it, then how were we going to get fish into Virgil? So therefore, they said that they, they could and would fish it and land it in Virgil. And that was their fight, that they said they would do this, and that was the reason they won, and therefore the Falcon Group's boats got, boat got kicked out. So now, we've got the exploratory, the people who said they could do it and would do it, there's nothing in the minister's statement that said they had to do it. So of course, that's the reason why we had to go in there Monday and see what persuasion and pressure we could put on government to see if there was some way to make these boats to live up to their commitment of fishing it and bringing it, and I'm using the word Virgil, but it's South Coast Sports. So that's the way that our meeting started. And I'll tell you that in, in the exploratory fishery, I think the scientists have, have, have uh, put out 40 test areas. So, you know, the boat just doesn't go where she wants to go. She's told which area is, is to be fished. Uh, that is the way that you go about it. You have so many uh, catches in each, each area. Well, when we sat down on Monday morning, it turned into quite a tough meeting because first started out with a, quite a row between the three LNO fishermen and the two J3K fishermen. Two J3K weren't allowed to fish, they wanted in, and three LNO were allowed to fish. So this turned into such a shamazzle that it looked as if there would be no exploratory fishery in three LNO. Uh, this fall. Now, if there was going to be no exploratory fishery this fall, then there would be no increase in quota in the year 2000. And I can tell you when these two groups of fishermen go at it, they really go at it. Anyway, in the middle of this, we get involved. And I, I'm certainly not going to try to tell you everything that happened. But it was going downhill and going real bad. And it got so bad that we had to call a recess. But during the recess, uh, the group started getting together in the corner. One was talking to the other and one and the other. And when we came back to sit down, uh, it was put to them uh, just what uh, was going to come about. And I was real surprised when one of the fishermen stood up and he said, we will fish the fish. 
And he said, we will land it on the south coast for us. All of it. Not half of it, not a quarter, but all of it. Now this is exactly what we wanted. This was acceptable. There's got to be a lot of, of the mechanics figured out just as who's fishing in what area, what the trip limit is going to be per trip, and so on. But that's all things that started and was worked on almost immediately. And as of this time, as far as I know, that most of that has been worked out. Now, it looks as if it's going to be about a 35,000 uh, pound trip limit. There's 120 boats, plus a 120 uh, under 65, I believe it is, and three larger vessels. Uh, each one would get one trip. However, it's more realistic that there may be 80 boats, because some of these boats won't be taken apart. There's some of these boats only 45 feet. So that's what the situation is, and they could be sailing as early as next week, and it is possible that you could have crab in your plant next week. A lot of things is going to depend on, of course, the weather. I can't tell you how many weeks work you're going to get. All I can tell you is, uh, for any of you who haven't got any stamps, it is quite possible you're not going to get enough. But then again, uh, that's not for sure. They could run up till the end of November. I don't know. So that's, that, that's the thing, you know, you just can't figure out. When the scientists said they've got enough information, they'll cut it off. Or if the weather is so bad they can't get any more, they'll cut it off then. Uh, there's a lot of concerns. Weather is going to play a big factor. You're talking 65 foot <laughs> boats, 250 miles out. Another thing is, and this has been the debate, and this has been an argument ever since the announcement. Some are saying you cannot land this crab without using refrigerated seawater. Those guys are saying they can. They say they can land a top-notch quality product in the Virgil without using it. So you stand up and one fellow say, I can't do it, and the other fellow say, you can't do it, I can, I can't. You know, you just can't win that argument. So the only thing you can do is go out and do it. And of course, the proof wouldn't have been whether they can do it or not. If this, the, the most worst thing that can happen in this exploratory fishery is if it doesn't turn off any crab. I mean, if it's not there, well, that's tough. But based on previous ones, that's not what we'll be, be expecting to add. If it is there, we've already, a few of us, have went into an area that we think that will bring it about for next year, whereby we'll be getting fish into this plant. And I must say, we would like to get it probably coming in about April, and if we could get it leveled out so that you could have a steady flow of crab for perhaps six or seven months of the year. Uh, I, think that, I think I've touched a good bit. I didn't make all that many notes, so I probably left out something. So I think at this point, I would certainly uh, leave it open and see if uh, any of you got any questions. Is there any questions you have coming in that you've got to answer now? Or is there some that haven't been answered? Uh, could you ask? Well, there at the meeting. The boat stand got two on the door down there and back there. Now we got it. Now we can stand there. That's what I said. The argument you can't do it, you can do it. That's the argument we were talking about. It can only be done one way. We'll find that out. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm not going to say nothing about that. Not according to the way they're writing it up. What they're saying is they've written up agreements in the shrimp fishery as well, whereby you police, you make your own rules and you, and you police your own self, so that you sit down as a group and you uh, sit down the rules, and if you violate the rules, then you get knocked out of the fishery or something like that. I, I just don't know really what it is, but they say that's not a problem.
be working around these shifts and stuff like that, and that's a common issue. But like I say, as for the question Keith is asking there, you can sit forever and argue with that. You can, you can't, you can, you can't. I know Nelson Bussey. Guarantees he can come to the south coast to catch a meat fish and bring it into the house right now, same boats. The problem wasn't fuel, wasn't the boats. The big concern as I get it is keeping the crab alive. And they tell us, and that comes from uh, Mr. Effort's department, that uh, if it's not a top product, then that's out. The other thing is, they say if you transfer a crab, if they bring it into St. John's and put it on a truck and then bring it into Burjo, there's a less chance of it arriving alive than there is if they bring it in boat. Mark Small, I'm going to mention him particularly because Sam Dunford is skipper on board of his boat, but he's one of those guys up in 3K who's looking for a chance to be able to go out in 3LNO and make just one trip. All they want is just two boats from 2J, 3K, and they've got a hundred and something boats to go there. And the man turned right around and to me and he said, I told Sam Dunford, he said that if I get a trip of fish, Sam, you take my boat, you go catch a load, and you take it to your own town. And I know that man was sincere when he said that. And I also, he told me that, that he, he can guarantee and apparently he's got some of the best boats. There's some of them boats can't do it. Like I say, it's 120 plus. More realistically, you're looking at 70 or 75 that will not be making the trips. I don't know. I'm certainly not going to argue with them that they can or they can't. They've been in that fishery for 30 years. And look at the boats that the uh, Marys will have in Hometown. These boats is not, cannot do it. Why not? They're not with the existing fleet. There's no more licenses. <coughs> If they had been fishing last year or something like that, maybe. Well, if they're fishing, if those boats can't bring top quality crab? I doubt if they will this year. So we're not either. We're back to where we You could be. Could be. But that's the thing that's got to be said. And one thing about it, like I started off with, if you don't have an exploratory, then you definitely get some increase in quota next year. But that exploratory is really important. Yes. Well, like I 
say, this is the thing that's been talked about, you know, and if these people can't do it, well, the, well then that's when the department going to look at another way of doing it, and this time these people can't look up and say they can do it, you know, because it'll be proved that they can't do it. So that was the old idea probably behind that. Another service was added to the Calder Health Care Center list in October. On Monday of this week, we were invited to the Calder Health Care Center for the opening of the gift shop. Today to help us celebrate the opening of our gift shop. Um, as, as you, most of you know, I'm Beth Tepford and I'm the Regional Director of Volunteer Resources. I just took over this position permanently in April and I'm really pleased to see something. I was telling Rose today, you know, um, as a volunteer manager, you see a lot of good work from your volunteers, but a lot of times you don't get to see the final finish of something. And to me, today, I'm just so thrilled. Last night I was home and I was dancing, I was doing a lot. I couldn't wait to come here, actually. So what I want to start off by doing is just to announce who our gift shop committee is, for those of you who weren't to our last meeting. Sheila actually <coughs> agreed to be our chairperson. No. Sheila basically will oversee the gift shop for us, and she will make sure that everything is running smoothly for us. She will be in direct contact with Jeanette and myself and Jenny. Then Isabel Han is going to be our vice chairperson. Teresa Dolleman is going to be our secretary. Yeah. Mary Pink has agreed to be our treasurer, and we're hoping that Mary's going to be so busy she's not going to know what to do. <laughs> and Hilda Han is going to be our scheduler. So if any of you want to volunteer in the gift shop and you're kind of thinking, I'm not quite sure, go see Hilda and she'll come in. Um, the other thing I want to mention is I want to say a special thank you to Jenny, who's inside. <laughs> Jenny's put her heart and soul in this. Virgio is part of Jenny's responsibilities, and she's the one who keeps pushing me and saying, come on, babe, we're going to do this, aren't we? And I keep saying, yes, we are. So like, she's kind of that push behind it all, too. And Jeanette, of course, who was always there to help us, so thank you. Rose couldn't stay today. She had both corner book two meetings that came up unexpectedly. But she didn't want to express how pleased she is. She said, once again, Virgio and the surrounding communities have pull together to say, yes, we want what's best for our residents and patients. So from Rose, I thank you. I'm sure that most of you will see her through the next coming months and she will stop by and thank you all. The gift shop hours have been posted and I'm really pleased. They're going to be open Monday to Friday from 1 to 4. We're going to try that and we're going to see how it works. The committee will then make the decision whether or not they need to stay open that line or what other hours they need to work. The things inside have been priced by the committee. Um, I know a lot of everything in there was donated. So right now everything Everything that's going to be sold is going to be a complete profit to us. We've had uh, Humpty Dumpty donated some chips to us, Pepsi donated some cakes, we rent to us to try to get us going. So I think that you all should, first of all, give yourself a big hand of applause and, and just realize what a wonderful job you've all done. And again, from my the end of it, I thank you all very much. From the Western Healthcare Corporation, we thank you. It's so wonderful to see such dedicated people. I told some of the ladies today I love coming to Virgil and this is why. You people just are the true spirit of volunteering. So from my heart, thank you very much. At this time I'd like to call on the mayor to say a few words and begin to officially cut the ribbon so that we can get our gift shop open. Mayor Hamm, thank, thank you. you. Well ladies, and I don't have to say gentlemen today because I don't see Not yet. Yeah, okay. Oh, there's one young fellow there, I think mean, that's a gentleman. <laughs> But anyway, this is an occasion I think that most mayors enjoy attending. It's when you're opening something. It's so much better to see something opening within your town rather than something closing. So on behalf of the Virgin Town Council, I would like to thank the uh, staff of the Calder Health Care Center and the volunteers who made uh, this gift shop possible. And uh, I wish you every success down the road, and I'm sure it will be one more service to the residents and to the visitors to the hospital that will uh, enhance and uh, keep up the good work which the uh, Calder Health Care uh, Center is providing for the town of Virgil. So that's all I've got to say, and now I would uh, cut the ribbon and declare your gift shop. The other side. Yay!
After the ribbon cutting ceremony, the guests were served cake and coffee in the new gift shop. The shop was stocked with many different items that was donated by members of the community. There were knitted goods, baby clothes, flower arrangements, crocheted items, personal care items, books, ornaments, and playing cards. Regional Director of, for Volunteer Services, Viv Tidford, has in place a gift shop committee. Chairperson of the committee is Sheila Oxford. Vice Chair is Isabel Ann. Secretary is Teresa Dallman. Treasurer is Mary Pink. And Scheduler is Elda Ann. The gift shop will be run by volunteers. We wish the gift shop committee every success in this project. Stay tuned for more of this year in review coming up after this. Icebergs drift south. Humpbacks migrate to the north. This is the place where their paths cross. They say you can't see the icebergs for whales. Imagine that. This next story might turn some people away from moose meat. Approximately three weeks ago, a local hunter made a startling discovery with his moose meat. Larry Rhymes was quite happy to have failed his moose license, but the feeling was short-lived. When Mr. Rhymes took his meat to be cut up, this is what he discovered. Worms. Lots of them. Mr. Rhymes immediately took the meat to the wildlife officer to be inspected. Mr. Rhymes was issued another license and the moose meat destroyed. We spoke to Mr. Ward Strickland and he informed us that this was the worst case he has seen. Only two cases of these worms has been reported in moose meat this year, none in caribou meat. Mr. Strickland told us that hunters should check the organs, either the heart or the liver, of a moose or a caribou by making a series of cuts. If the animal is contaminated, it will be seen in these organs. Mr. Strickland also stated that if a hunter does find his meat to be contaminated, bring it to the wildlife office for inspection. The wildlife officer, in following with his own division guidelines, will decide what action should be taken. Mr. Strickland stated that they did not give a yes or a no on the safety of eating meat, either at a carcass or cut-up stage. If there are obvious areas of disease, the answer is easy. However, in any wild product, the risk is assumed by the owners. If it doesn't look good or smell good, don't eat it. This story was probably one of the happiest stories that we covered on This Week in Review. For seven long years, the Burgio fish plant finally opened for production on Friday, October the 22nd, and again on Monday, October the 25th. At approximately 7 p.m., a total of 110 people started working on the much talked about crab. There were approximately 98 workers called in to start training in the processing of the crab. By the end of the first shift, workers had completed 17,000 pounds of crab. We spoke to Clayton Ingram and he informed us that the buyers for this crab was on site on Friday. The company and the buyers were very pleased with the work done. Mr. Ingram stated that the workers were quite quick to catch on. He also said that the quality was what they expected for workers that were training, but the yield was up. Overall, the company and the buyers were very pleased with the results. The mood at the plant was just like Christmas morning, as one worker told us. Emotions were running quite high. There were tears of happiness and smiles of joy. On Monday of this week, it was the same story. Many happy faces and strong emotions. Mr. Ingram told us that the workers were very eager to start working. They weren't required to report to work until 8.30 or 9 a.m., but most of them were already at work by 7.30, ready, willing, and more than able to start. Approximately 96 to 100 people worked and processed 23,000 pounds of crab which was trucked in from Port de Grave. The company had planned to have a second shift on Monday at 1.30, but due to mechanical problems and the quality of the crab, it wasn't possible. I spoke to Bruce Vetcher on Wednesday, and he informed me that 25% of the shifts were not trained with crab, but when the next shipment comes in, these people will be called first. The crab boats were expected to arrive sometime during the weekend. We look forward to seeing the plant going full swing in the near future. This morning at approximately 8.14 a.m., Virgil got a very special Halloween treat. The first crab boat arrived at the fish plant wharf.
As you can see in the picture, a white speedboat escorted the Eastern Princess II up through the reach. As both boats approached, we could clearly see that the Hiscourt was none other than Mayor Anne. the Eastern Princess too at dock, Mayor Ann at a pre- Without further ado, one crew member hoisted the Burgio flag on the Eastern Princess II. The second boat docked approximately one hour later. In November, we were quite fortunate to see the product of a refrigerated seawater crab boat. On Monday of this week, we were invited to Falcon Seafood Plant 
to watch the crab being discharged from the Baffin Bay. When we arrived around 10.30 p.m., there were quite a few people standing around. Apparently, the Baffin Bay was having trouble getting the door to the oiling shed open. Aidan Daly invited us aboard the Baffin Bay to look at the condition of the crab. This is the first crab boat to land at Burgio with refrigerated seawater. As you can see, the crab are very active and alive. <laughs> leave the boat, it is taken to an area where it is graded. As each crab comes their way, the graders take crab from different areas in a particular load. For example, this crab was taken from the top left-hand corner and the bottom right-hand corner. This way, the graders get a better sample. Then the forklift takes it to the olding shed to be processed. Later on that evening, we took our cameras to the old off the Baffin Bay to see how the last of the crab in the shipment was faring. As you can see, it is still alive and trying to crawl away.
Approximately 10 a.m. on Tuesday, we visited the crab again, this time inside the plant to see how it was doing. They're still alive. According to reports, only 1% of this shipment of crab from the Baffin Bay was lost. Near the end of November, we lost the biggest food store in Burgio. On Monday of this week, our town suffered a tremendous loss. At approximately 11 a.m., the fire department was called to the scene of a fire at our local food land. When we arrived, there were towers of smoke coming from the far end of the building. We were informed that all the staff and customers had gotten out safe and sound. Later in the day, the Burger Fire Department received help from Ramia and Stephenville Fire Departments. There was also plenty of other volunteers from the community. The RCMP news release states that the damage is estimated to be in the range of one to $1.5 million. The cause of the fire has been attributed to a electrical short in the basement. Our town was in a state of shock and disbelief over this terrible loss, but none greater than the owners, operators, and staff that worked at the business. December brought more work for Burgio. Two new projects have been approved and are up and running for Burgio. The first project we visited was with a group that has been hired to cut brush from Burgio to Peter Strides. These projects were applied for by the BDDB for the residents that required more hours of employment to qualify for EI benefits. There were approximately 21 people hired to cut brush along the Burgio Highway for a seven week period. Many of the workers don't require the full seven weeks to qualify for their EI benefits. For example, two or three workers only need two weeks. 
A couple of others need three weeks. There are approximately five workers with the project that need all seven weeks. Through this method, the BDDB were able to R this number of people. The second project we visited on Monday was at Aaron's Arm. Five workers had been hired for eight week period to head another 125 feet to the existing docking facilities. With projects like these, many of our residents will be able to stay at home and not have to leave town to get hours required to apply for their EI benefits. Stay with us for more of the year in review coming up after this. In a scene from prehistory, still fjords run deep, hemmed in by giant granite walls, carved by volcanoes, tectonic upheaval, 20 times as old as the Rockies. Our park, imagine that. BBS Playbill. Tune in on Tuesday at 7 p.m. for the St. John Center High School Awards Night. Join us on Wednesday for the St. John Center High Theater Art Skits performed at the elementary school. Tune in on Thursday when we'll have the St. John's Center High Talent Show. Join Pans and the Gang for two stories, a craft, and lots of fun on Saturday morning at 11 a.m. on Pansy's Garden. And I'll be here again next week with This Week in Review. For This Week in Review, I'm Marie Rose. Good night.